Hi everyone, and thank you for tuning in. My name is Megha Arora, and I work in the Privacy and Civil Liberties team at Palantir. And my name is Mihir Bato, and I am also an engineer on the Privacy and Civil Liberties team at Palantir. Now, before we begin our talk about handling and managing sensitive data and data platforms, we wanted to give you folks an idea of what Palantir does and the problems we've worked on in this space. Palantir is a software company that builds software for data-driven operations and decision-making. Our platforms power critical operations for government and commercial clients, and these clients are all in dozens of nations and industries that exist worldwide. We also donate our software and services to select nonprofits dedicated to improving human lives. Now, our platforms allow these organizations to better manage the data that they lawfully control. Mihir and I work with the Privacy and Civil Liberties team. Our team's mission is to design, build, and deploy privacy protective technologies and to foster a culture of responsibility around their development and use. We examine privacy and data protection from a multitude of perspectives and work together with internal stakeholders as well as customers to navigate the challenges in this space. As Mihir mentioned, today we'll be discussing technical learnings from our work focused on detection and management of sensitive information. We have worked with many organizations across a variety of different industries, and many of them have the same problem. They struggle with keeping track of the sensitive data. Often, an organization has extremely vast and complex data pipelines, one of which we have depicted in this slide. Each colored line you see in there is a data asset, and each of those could be hundreds of columns wide with millions of rows, or may not even be fully in structured form as rows and columns. So when we use the term data platform in the title of our talk, we're alluding to this sort of a setup where an organization could be pulling in data from many different data source systems to put it all together to unlock its analytical capabilities. This comprises the information pool within which sensitive data also resides. As a result, it's a struggle to manage this data. They can't effectively apply access controls. It's hard to create a snapshot of what sensitive data is being used for what purposes. And how do they apply data retention rules on this information then? This also presents a serious problem from a regulatory perspective. With the influx of data privacy regulation taking effect in the last few years, for example, the General Data Protection Regulation, or GDPR, highlights that data classification facilitates upholding the rights of data subjects. HIPAA, or the Health Insurance Portability and Accountability Act, underscores that knowing where all health records are stored helps in implementing security controls for proper data protection. So, that was the challenge in front of us when we started working on this problem. Conceptually, there are two steps organizations have to take. First, they should be able to identify their sensitive data, regardless of where it comes from and what it looks like. We refer to that as a detection problem. Taking it back to an organization's data in a data platform, let's take the example of a pharma company. What are the different types of sensitive information a pharma company might have? There's electronic medical records, so EMR, containing patient demographics, medical and surgical histories, uh, diagnosis, outpatient visit, hospitalization records, treatment and pharmacy records. There's uh, NLP data derived from pathology reports or clinician notes and other textual data housed within the EMR. There's also molecular data, including clinical sequencing and research sequencing information based on which future patterns might be filed. There could also be other sensitive PII about researchers and employees and financial information as well. So a good detection mechanism should have coverage over all of these different data categories. Second step is management or appropriate handling in some way. This generally happens by virtue of data minimization and access controls for sensitive data, but could depend on the rules of the organization or could be based on legal restrictions. Going back to the pharma company example, maybe it's okay to share a subset of the patient level data with a researcher who has IRB and other data use approvals. 
but not other category of sensitive information. For another use case, it might be appropriate to have patient level sensitivities aggregated. Before we get into the solution design, let's understand what are the complexities we aim to tackle to some extent. I just mentioned different categories of sensitive data within one type of organization, that is pharma companies. But in real, we have to build an industry agnostic solution, meaning that there is no one size fits all definition to what sensitive data could look like. Think everything from SSNs to airline tail numbers. Moreover, data that is sensitive in one context might not be sensitive in another context. A simple lockdown approach for sensitive data can be far too restrictive. The aim should be to introduce transparency and accountability while ensuring that authorized individuals are able to responsibly access the data they need for their job. This makes risk mitigation a lot harder because it requires that our tool should be able to interpret and enforce management rules selectively and specifically. Last but not the least, the process of translating a policy constraint to a concrete technical problem is a non-trivial one and requires data protection units and data engineering teams to collaborate. We have seen teams get stuck in this process. Often, non-technical individuals with legal and compliance background have context on how information should be categorized and what rules should determine legitimate use of sensitive information. They struggle with being able to transfer this knowledge to engineers who are responsible for configuring controls that determine access to data systems. Now, earlier, Mega broke down the problem into two components. The first was the detection of sensitive data, and the second was the management of sensitive data. Now, our solution follows a similar outline. So we first have to find a method to capture a definition of sensitive data that's not just legal text, but it can actually be used in software. We want to be able to encode this definition so we can use it in incoming or existing data. Now, once we've been able to find different types of sensitive data, once we've been able to make these definitions for detection, we also need a specification of what to do with that sensitive data. And we call this management. So for example, if we are restricting access, who are the individuals who retain their access? Or if we want to hash or encrypt sensitive data, what algorithms do we use? What keys do we use, right? All of this should be configurable in a governance user's management interface. And we'll see an example of this shortly. Now let's look at detection. Again, here we designed an interface that makes it very easy for data protection units, governance users, to technically define the blueprint for sensitive data categories. Now the first way our product allows this is through common regular expressions or regexes. Now, we believe regular expressions are robust enough to encompass many different definitions of sensitive data, really of any string type. So they can be used across many different organizations and industries. And to make this even more robust, we allow our governance users to specify a regex for both the data content and the data schema. So for the column names. Now here you see, we're trying to make regexes that match email addresses or a column that has email addresses. Additionally, we let data governance users specify whether both regexes should match or if just one of them should match, which either helps them limit false positives or expands the remit of the sensitive data definition. And now finally, you'll notice that for the data content, we have an optional field to specify threshold percentages. This gives governance users an additional lever to weed out the false positives by requiring that a certain percentage of a column in a table must match the content regex in order for the overall definition, this overall definition of PII or sensitive data to have matched. Now there are several types of data for which it's hard to use this sort of regex pattern matching, right? Names are a great example of this. It's tough to make a regex for, na for names. Now, also certain ID numbers like US social security numbers often have formats that are similar to some not as sensitive numbers like 
US nine digit zip codes. So you have a nine digit social security number and a nine digit zip code. If you get rid of the dashes, they look the same. Now for these kinds of data categories, our product can be actually pointed at existing known sensitive data. So whatever you already have in your platform, we can use that to find any new sensitive data. We call this overlap detection. So in the example you see here, we have some free text that has entered the system that contains the name of an employee with the last name Quinn. Now, because we have an existing table that contains all employee names, we can use overlap detection to detect the sensitive data. Of course, the drawback to this is that we must have a prior corpus of ACLED sensitive data. But for data like ID numbers or perhaps employee names or customer names, this is often already true in many organizations that we work with. Now, once we have sensitivity definitions, we need another component to allow users to specify actions that could be taken post-detection. So there are a wide range of actions we support for this, like restricting data access or obfuscating the sensitive information or even, even deleting it, right? So here, we have a specification that will apply something that we call a security marking. A security marking essentially is a data, data classification. Only people who have access to that data classification will be able to see that data. Now in this specific example, we have a security marking called PII. So only users on the platform that have access to this PII security marking will be able to see this data if we detect some sensor data in it. So putting it all together, if we have a regex, regex definition or an overlap definition, that matches some data in our platform, the governance users could pre-specify that those tables should be marked with PII security marking, with the PII security marking, to prevent unauthorized users from accessing those tables. Access controls are great tools to restrict access to sensitive data, but they're rather blunt instruments. It's an all or nothing bargain. Even if there's a tiny sliver of PII, an entire data set could be locked down, which could incentivize organizations to give more people access to the data, to even those users who actually want to utilize the non-sensitive information in the data. Naturally, this is undesirable from a privacy perspective because we want users to only have access to sensitive data they absolutely need for their work. Because of this, we have other post-detection actions as well that we allow users to specify. The one highlighted in this slide is data minimization. In the example you see here, we have actually responded to the detection of PII by hashing the column that contains employee IDs. Alternatively, we could have also masked the values or encrypted them if it is desirable to be able to decrypt the data downstream. Critically, only the data that is deemed to be sensitive is minimized and all other data remains as is. This now allows users to analyze the data without knowing who is the individual uh, the data pertains to. Also note here that if there are other columns in the table that can collectively be used to re-identify individuals, then those columns can also be redacted in the same way. Encryption is the ideal management solution here if we want selective users to be able to decrypt employee IDs. In that case, privileged users could, de could decrypt employee ID information, while users that don't have such access would not be able to do so. There are some additional considerations to account for here, and we believe they are also relevant for any tooling solving this problem. The accuracy of the detection strategy is key because the cost of false positives could be onerous. How do we make sure that regex doesn't match any other non-sensitive information? How can feedback from false positives be used to improve the accuracy of the detection strategy over time? Scale and compute limitations are also real for such a system. We are talking about running these scans for every single data asset. Should we run a full scan on every new version of data? Can some of the checks be combined for compute efficiency? 
Maybe the solution needs to keep track of what has been scanned and when, and only re-triggers detection when certain criteria is met. We have been asked about automating parts of the solution by leveraging the power of machine learning and natural language processing techniques. That's easier said than done because supervised machine learning needs labels. And for that, you already need to know what sensitive data is and probably also where it lives. So there's a chicken and egg problem there. But providing some out of the box detection rules for common PII types is quite doable. There are regulatory restrictions defining concrete rules for sensitive data classification and use. In specific jurisdictions, the interfaces that we have built also had to be the means for translating some of the legal text into technical rules. And finally, given the fairness implications of protected attributes, uh, which is sensitive PII, in data science and machine learning pipelines, that opens the door for another category of very hard technical problems, which the FAT ML community will relate with. That brings us to conclusions. Most technical systems ingest and store sensitive information. It's challenging to identify such data and appropriately tackle it via a generalized product solution. We walk through specifics of how to break down the problem and what a potential solution can look like. B2B privacy enhancing technology needs to be built to serve more dynamic use cases than B2C, where often there are innate limits to how the system can be deployed or used. A thoughtful software engineering approach is required to build robust and flexible privacy enhancing technologies. Traditional approaches often end up with restrictive software that is not useful enough, or worse, functional software which undermines user privacy and respect. We highlighted this by ensuring that the solution offers maximum customization for defining sensitive data, also for determining actions that should be taken post-detection, and finally, while thinking through some additional considerations of the solution within a data platform. Data management solutions must also be built with data protection users in mind. Our solution provides a systematic way for data protection users and data engineering teams to work together. It ensures that critical stakeholders are looped into relevant parts of the process. We have found that by bringing them into the data platform, it makes the problem more concrete and provides all the pieces needed to solve the sensitive data puzzle. We have observed that data protection units tend to not be users of the data platform themselves, and bringing them on as users can greatly transform the way they think about the problem. It is almost fascinating how non-technical users pick up technical terminology and start speaking and thinking in that language. Thank you for your attention. Now, Mihir and I would be happy to take your questions.